I feel like the best cartoons came out during the decade of the 2000s. Between Cartoon Network, Disney, and Nickelodeon, some of the greatest animated shows ever were produced in this era. Ed, Ed, Nettie, SpongeBob, Avatar, The Last Airbender, Kim Possible, The Fairly Odd Parents, but one of my favorite of these shows was Teen Titans. The show was badass, wholesome, and hilarious. It was critically acclaimed at the time, and to this day, it's widely regarded for its compelling storylines, character depth, use of action, music, and for never shying away from mature themes. The team's led by Robin, Batman's former sidekick who is newly single and ready to mingle with crime. He carries the same energy as his former partner, possessing an unshakable moral compass and no sense of humor. He tries to be the strong leader the Titans need while simultaneously balancing the desires of a normal teenager. Robin has no superpowers, obviously, and instead is revered for his iron will and mental fortitude. Though he's fearless in battle, Robin is pretty awkward and gets flustered in social situations. Starfire is an alien princess from the planet Tamaran. She has immense physical strength, in addition to the power of flight and ability to project bright green colored energy from her hands and eyes. Not to mention her strongest ability, her slay. Small amusing doppelganger. <laughs> She's cheerful and aloof. She always feels like a fish out of water on this new planet and deals with the constant stress of being unfamiliar with her surroundings. To replenish your heart with warmness and cheer, I offer a traditional Tamaranian folk song. Cyborg is a fun-loving, cybernetically enhanced former jock. He's a strategist, tech guru, and second-in-command behind Robin. He was just your friendly neighborhood genius-level high school quarterback. Now he fights crime, because why not? Raven comes from the parallel dimension of Azeroth and is the daughter of an interdimensional demon named Trigon. She has telekinesis, force fields, and kind of has a variety of powers due to her magic. She has a reserved personality and spends most of her time listening to My Chemical Romance, probably. Most of the time, she remains secretive and distant, but after she warms up to her team members, she starts to see them as family. Her character was so popular from the cartoon that her later portrayals and comics made attempts to be closer to this version of her. Last but not least, Beast Boy, aka Changeling, aka Garfield Logan, is a shapeshifter who can transform into any living organism. He's the youngest member and serves as the main comedic relief of the group. Before joining the Titans, he was a member of the Doom Patrol until he was kicked out. He's the fun-loving, caring, doofy type of character who is shown to be fiercely protective when he or his friends are threatened. The show's animation style is heavily influenced by Japanese anime, specifically the show FLCL. They have running gags, subversions, fourth wall breaks. The show's just fucking silly when it wants to be. Your initiation. <laughs> That's it? Don't laugh. You have to eat the unicycle. The theme song is still to this day a banger. It's performed by Puffy Amiyumi, who also had their own show on Cartoon Network at the time. It's a blend of J-pop and the 1960s Batman theme. It's one of the only title sequences I do not mind sitting through like every time. There were a lot of things to like about Teen Titans right out of the gate, and there were spots for the show to improve. The very first episode displayed just how serious the tone of the show could get. The plot of the episode has the Titans fighting against recurring villains from the Hive Academy, and when they lose, Robin is insinuated to be deceased for part of the episode. The Hive Academy then tracks down the remaining Titans and like physically evicts them from the Titans Tower. In this episode, you can already see the dialogue really shines. It feels hyper-realistic for what's supposed to be a kid's show. Or what? Our bad vibes will keep you from meditating? I wish Robin were here. Well, he's not! Don't you guys get it? They won! We lost! It's over! Then, the Teen Titans are finished? Not yet. Not if I can help it. The story arc for the series introduces us to our main antagonist, Slade who was based on the villain Deathstroke. But the writers changed his name to Slade because they thought Deathstroke sounded too dark for a kid's show. Understandably, he's voiced by full-time actor and part-time hand pisser Ron Perlman. Robin becomes obsessed with stopping Slade, so he assumes the identity of Red X and goes double agent in order to infiltrate the operation. When he does this, he chooses not to tell the other Titans and tries to fool them instead, believing the ends justify the means. The emotional core of the season comes from the storyline and the complications that arise from his deceit. Again, 
the maturity and chops it takes to pull this off in 2003 on a kids network are pretty indescribable. When four of the titans are blasted by a gun that infects them with lethal nanoscopic probes, Robin becomes Slade's apprentice to keep the titans safe. Since they're unaware he's being blackmailed, it's intriguing to watch the tension build up from seeing the team in awe of what Robin's become. During this arc, we learn a lot about Robin's character, how his confidence can turn into arrogance and lead to his downfall. After they defeat Slade, Starfire apologizes to Robin for ever questioning where his loyalty lied. When things were bad, there was a moment where I truly believed that you were like Slade. I doubted you, and for that, I am sorry. I doubted myself, Star. Focused, serious, determined. As much as I hate to admit it, he and I are kind of alike. At this point, you see Robin realize how close heroes and villains are, how easy it is to turn to the dark side. As season 2 progressed, it becomes clear that the showrunners had begun to pin down exactly what made the characters compelling and how to showcase that in some way every episode. The Teen Titans, despite being superheroes, are just as emotionally damaged as any one of us. Raven grapples with the shame of being a hellspawn. Beast Boy has an inferiority complex. Robin lost his parents and is dealing with an identity crisis after choosing to become his own hero. Starfire is living on an alien world, and Cyborg grieves the loss of his humanity. Every story manages to get to the heart of what makes these characters tick, regardless of how outlandish the plot may become. And as a result of this, even filler episodes feel like they have great entertainment value. In the second season, we're introduced to possibly the most complex character in the whole show. Don't lose control. Don't lose control. It's revealed in the Teen Titan comics that Terra was the illegitimate daughter of the King of Markovia. Through experimentation, Terra and her brother obtained Earth manipulation powers. After obtaining these powers, her father requested that she leave Markovia for the United States to prevent the scandal of a king having an illegitimate daughter from becoming public. She's already clearly very powerful, but has little control over her abilities, and as a result, the Titans are hesitant to allow her into the group. On their next mission with Terra, she almost accidentally crushed crushes Beast Boy with a chunk of rock and then just runs away. Then Slade confronts her and works her up into a literal whirlwind of emotion. Beast Boy is able to talk her down from the ledge. It's okay, Tara. I'm here. I'm here. Check it out. She then returns in Episode 8, Titans Rising, when she displays her much improved control over her powers and says she's ready to join the Titans. But the team hesitates to accept her right away, and she gets extremely butthurt. This to me truly shows the narcissistic side of Terra. She gets extremely upset whenever things don't go her way. The Titans decide they let her prove herself during the next mission, but Raven is still skeptical. Slay's back, and these new worm-like robots are causing earthquakes around the city, so the Titans go to investigate the happenings underground, and during the mission, Terra and Raven must learn to work together. By the end of the episode, Terra learns about trust, and the Titans learn to trust her, and they accept her into the group. In episode 10, Betrayal, we pick up after Terra's been on the team for a few weeks. It's obvious she's hiding something, and she's on her laptop suspiciously when Beast Boy knocks on her door and like asks her on a date. At first, she rejects him, but then she's like, fuck it, and they leave and end up at some shady dive bar. Beast Boy is put off by this, but Tara seems comfortable, so he's just happy to be with her. She gets freaked out when she thinks she sees Slade in the mirror, and she and Beast Boy leave. As this is happening, Titan's tower is under attack by Slade's robot army, but Beast Boy drops his communicator at the dive bar and is unaware. Beast Boy, come in! Terra and Beast Boy are at an abandoned carnival having a grand old time, but Slade appears while they're riding the Ferris wheel, and it's revealed Terra has been working with him the entire time. I think at this point I should address that I get heavy toxic relationship vibes from Terra and Slade together. The way they interact just doesn't seem like a master-student relationship, and when I looked into it, yeah, they get together in the comics while Terra is an underage runaway. Damn, Slade, I knew you were a bad guy, but Jesus. Terra saves Beast Boy's life from Slade, but he won't forgive her for her charade, and they go their separate ways. Terra then appears in episode 12 and 13, Aftershock Part 1 and 2. Hey guys, miss me? Having gained more strength under Slade's tutelage, she wipes the floor with the Titans. Yet, Beast Boy still holds on to hope for her, and he insists that the Titans give Terra one last chance before they decidedly take her out. She kicks their ass again, and then they get serious. I want Terra. Ah! 
Titans start to beat Terra, and she flees, and back at Slade's hideout, he begins to physically abuse her. At this point, you really start to feel bad. No one deserves to endure this kind of treatment. Okay, this is starting to drag on, so basically in the end, she sacrifices herself to defeat Slade, and now she's a statue. Overall, I can see why the Terra arc was such a big deal for viewers when it happened. She's a complicated character and fits the definition of an anti-hero, which is hardly ever portrayed in kids' animation. I could empathize with her at times. Ultimately, I thought she was pretty annoying though. Season 3 features the series-long arc of Cyborg fighting Brother Blood and the Hive Academy. We get introduced to a bunch of new titans, Aqualad, Mossy Manos, Bumblebee, and Speedy, but the arc is mostly about Cyborg's personal growth. He temporarily leaves the Teen Titans to head a new team of superheroes. The plots are generally more of the same in Season 3, and it received positive but mixed reviews from critics. Some highlights were the reappearance of Red X, the Selkie episode, and Haunted. The episode where Robin keeps fighting Slade only to find out that none of the other Titans can see him. This is so fucking dark for a kid's show, dude. I can't. <laughs> season 4 was originally intended to be the series finale of Teen Titans. The season arc features the introduction of Raven's father and the introduction of the prophecy. The arc shows Raven in denial of the prophecy up until the very moment the skies go black. It culminated in the epic three-part finale, The End, which had Robin once again team up with Slade. Slade was double-crossed by Trigon, and he realizes that the only way to defeat the uncontainable evil is to work alongside his sworn enemy. So he helps the Titans. My family, this is my home, and you are not welcome here. And I thought this would have been a great way to end the show. Season 5 was probably my favorite season. Narratively, almost every episode is working towards the season arc of Beast Boy fighting the Brotherhood of Evil. It felt a lot more focused and not afraid to have a fight scene go on for most of the episode. The animation was better than ever as well. The humor was toned down and not as frequent. Next. Who are you two supposed to be? I, uh... am the Dr. Amazing Mumgon, the Terrible, and this is my henchman, uh... Henshi. Episodes like Revved Up and Go proved how much the team had left in the tank creatively, and they wanted to continue. Before the season began, creators strongly encouraged fans to show support for the show to Cartoon Network, as it hadn't been renewed for a sixth season yet. In mid-November 2005, TitansTower.com reported that prospects for another season were looking extremely unlikely. Several days after this initial posting, word came that Cartoon Network had officially terminated the show. Why? 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 According to Will Wheaton, the actor who voiced Aqualad, the decision not to renew the series was based on the sixth season pitch. But Wheaton's story was contradicted by series story editor Rob Hoagie, who stated that the decision came from Cartoon Network, not WB, and that the crew was informed during the writing phase of season five that there were no plans for a sixth season. The show's producer, David Slack, indicated that he was given different reasons for the show's cancellation. Either the ratings dropped after the scary season four, or Mattel wanted the show dead because Bandai had the show's toy deal. Cartoon Network announced that Mattel had become its master toy licensee in 2006. Anyways, after the series arc, the final episode was titled Things Change, and it's become somewhat of a controversial end to the show. After the events of the Brotherhood arc, the Titans finally head back to the tower when they're called in to stop another monster who's causing ruckus. Beast Boy gets diverted chasing after a schoolgirl who looks exactly like Terra, except she says she doesn't remember him. Beast Boy tries to tell her that she's Terra and jog her memory, but she persists that she isn't someone who was a hero. She tells him that she isn't the hero he thinks she is, that things aren't how he remembers them, and that she can't be friends with him again. Terra essentially confirms her identity, but departs before Beast Boy can make any progress. Time's up. Terra. Things change, Beast Boy. The girl you want me to be is just a memory. As he runs towards a bright light, 
ending the series. To me, this symbolizes somewhat of a death of innocence for Beast Boy. The season has been about him and his character arc, from being kicked out of the Doom Patrol, to being the weakest Titan, to leading his own team of heroes. The only matter left to deal with was the statue of Terra and the unresolved feelings she left Beast Boy with. Whether he likes it or not, Beast Boy accepts that things do in fact change, just as the future of the show and all those involved were about to do. However you slice it, Teen Titans was officially D.E.D. -E dead. After the last episode, Warner Brothers announced a feature film titled Teen Titans Trouble in Tokyo. It's okay. The only meaningful development was Starfire and Robin finally getting together. The Titans go to Japan and fight a guy with ink powers. It felt like water down for me and I don't know, it just felt weird. These days, there's a live action version of the characters currently in its third season. I haven't watched it and I don't really know anyone who has. So there's also Teen Titans Go, which we're not gonna get into for obvious reasons. The original versions of the character returned in the movie Teen Titans Go versus Teen Titans, mostly in order to prop up the Go characters. I got through part of it, but it's a kid's movie, so Teen Titans remains one of the most impactful and endearing cartoons of all time. And I'm grateful I got to be in the target audience at the time to experience the hype. I remember how much the episode stuck with me. When I was little, me and my friends would just play Teen Titans. Like, we were just outside pretending to be the characters. Not a phone in sight, just people living life, just having a good time. <laughs> Rewatching this had me feeling more nostalgic than Frank Ocean on his first mixtape. Shout out to HBO Max for having all the content on their platform. Drop a comment if you have an idea of what kind of video I should do next or what I should watch. Hasta la bye-bye. Don't let the door hit you with a good lord split you.